Well, good evening, everyone. I want to wish you, first of all, a very, very happy feast day. This is the vigil of the Feast of the Transfiguration. So uh, because you were in the house of the Transfiguration, uh, this is a solemnity for you all. So I hope and pray that you'll stick around after the talk and enjoy some festive candies and even more festive fraternity. My name is Father John Paul Erickson. I serve as the pastor of this beautiful parish, Transfiguration. And whether you are a parishioner, a fan of Father Bear, an admirer of Archbishop Hebda, or a parishioner of this glorious archdiocese, your presence is a great gift, and we thank you for it. Shortly after my arrival at Transfiguration three years ago, the Lord put upon my heart a desire to honor Father Bear in some kind of substantial way. Father Bear, for those who may not know, was the ninth pastor of this parish and died quite unexpectedly after eight years of noble and fervent service to this community. And there's not a day that goes by, I mean that sincerely, that I do not thank God for the gift of following such a man in service of this great parish which he loved so much. Prior to his service at Transfiguration, Father Bear was rector of St. John Vianney College Seminary for well over a decade, during which time the seminary grew in numbers, fervor and identity, becoming one of the strongest college seminaries in the nation, a reputation it still rightly deserves. Father Bear was a renowned homilist and speaker, and his clarity, conviction, and humor helped many to know and to love Jesus Christ, including some of y'all. I know that some of you would fall into that camp. It's only fitting then to honor Father Bear with a speaker series in which equally renowned speakers will share with us wisdom and insight into the life of our faith. The timing of the series is not accidental, as the month of August is dedicated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and it is to this image of burning love that we entrust this series, an effort to honor a beloved priest, servant, and son of God. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Well, my dear friends, it is difficult to express how grateful I am to our first speaker of this year's Father Bear lecture series. Archbishop Hebda has been our shepherd since 2016, installed on the feast day of Our Lady of Fatima. And Archbishop Hebda is a loyal son of Pittsburgh, He is a shepherd of this local church, and he has shepherded it in perhaps the most difficult point in our diocese's history. And he is a devotee of one of my favorites, Mama T, St. Teresa of Calcutta, taking for his own Episcopal motto a a portion of a prayer charity say every day. A prayer Archbishop Hebda has a great devotion to St. John Henry Newman, only Jesus, only Jesus. May this prayer uh, be all of ours, that all of us might raise the fragrance of Christ in a world that needs that fragrance more than ever. The Archbishop has agreed to speak to us about the parish's role in evangelization. As I'm sure the Archbishop will mention, this is one of the key points of our upcoming synod. And so I'm especially grateful to Archbishop for being willing to speak about this topic that is important not only for the universal church and our local church, but I know is deeply within his own Episcopal and and presence. Let us give Archbishop a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Father Erickson, for those very kind words. And thanks to all of you who have gathered here, and certainly to those who are participating uh, via live stream as well. When I was a little boy, I asked where I got the name Bernard. And my parents explained to me that Bernard meant bold as a bear. Now, it means in its uh, origin, bold as the animal, the bear. (laughs) But I, since I've come to the Twin Cities, I've been wishing that it meant bold as another bear, your pastor, former pastor, Father Bear, (laughs) who was renowned for his boldness as well as for his zeal. 
right? And those two things went together for him. And I was so grateful for the, the topic that uh, Father Erickson gave to me because I think it, it gives honor to Father Bear, who was, as uh, Father John Paul mentioned, an extraordinary rector at the St. John Vianney Seminary. That was where I first uh, heard about him because for the years before I was named a bishop, I was working in Rome in the Pontifical Council for Legislative Texts, a very small office with a very long name. Uh, but all the time that I was doing that office work, I also served as a spiritual director at the North American College, the American Seminary in Rome. And it was there that I first got to know alumni of the St. John Vianney Seminary. And I found them to be extraordinary. They were just so well prepared to study theology. They were so far advanced in their spiritual lives. They just seemed to have all of the pieces of the puzzle in just the right place. And when I would ask about that, they would say, oh, that's all our rector, Father Bear. <laughs> so I was all excited uh, to be able to meet him when I finally uh, came to the Twin Cities as the administrator first and then as the archbishop. But as, as I got to know him, uh, I came to appreciate the great job that he had done at St. John Vianney Seminary, but I also saw such an incredible fruitfulness in the context of parish life, this parish. And I realized how important transfiguration was to Father Bear. And it was the same love for the gospel that had motivated him to be a superb rector that also motivated him to be a loving and zealous pastor with boldness. <laughs> and the way in which he approached this parish as being a vehicle for evangelization is an example that I think we all need to study. We all benefit from looking at how it is that Father Bear was able to use the structure of the parish as a way of bringing people to Jesus Christ. And that's ultimately what the work of evangelization is. It's bringing people to the gospel. And Father Bear understood that that was his task as pastor here at Transfiguration. It was to bring people to the gospel. And so this evening, as we have the opportunity to reflect a bit on evangelization and especially on how evangelization fits into the very essence of what it means to be a parish, I think we need to be mindful of Father Bear, mindful of the way in which uh, he uh, certainly left to us uh, this renewed parish of transfiguration as an example of what an evangelizing parish can be. I'm so grateful that Father John Paul Erickson has, has taken up the baton, right? We're all watching the Olympics these days. If you don't have a good pass on the baton, everything goes down the tubes. <laughs> but Father John Paul has done such a fabulous job of being able to carry forward uh, the baton that is the mission of this parish. And I'm anxious to be able to share a little bit with you this evening about evangelization in the parish. And in fact, as the topic that Father Erickson gave to me was evangelization, the parish's reason for being. So thank you for that, Father. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. That's often the last words that we hear spoken at the Mass. And like everything during the Mass, it's important. Huh? We're told to go. Because the love of God that we experience in the liturgy isn't meant to stay in the pews. Pope Francis keeps reminding us that it's what happens beyond the walls of the church that are the proof in the pudding. That's the test of what it is that we do here as we gather around the Lord's table. What's important is how it then propels us to go forward into the world. In fact, even our English word for the divine liturgy, mass, comes from the Latin word misa, 
which implies being sent, sent on a mission. The church is essentially saying by telling us to go (laughs) and sending us is saying, you've been fed with the Lord's body and blood. Now get to work. (laughs) Christ has been sending his followers on mission from the very beginning. As he said in the great commission that's memorialized above the main doors of our cathedral, our beautiful cathedral, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. It's the most important thing that that Jesus says. It's not surprising, is it, that uh, when we're about to take leave of our loved ones, we we make sure that right before we go, we tell them what's most important. My mother and father always taught us how important it is to say, I love you, before we would be going away to college or going away to work or whatever that might be. It was a little bit confusing because our neighbors also had a priest son and when he was leaving, they would always say, don't disgrace the family. (laughs) It's a little bit different, but it's nonetheless one of those important messages. And, it, and so we, we, we save those things that are most important to the end so that we'll remember what it is that they are. And that's what Christ did here too. Go and make disciples of all the nations. That's evangelization, brothers and sisters. The same mission that Jesus Christ shared with his first followers is still shared with us today. We too are called to go and to share the gospel in word and deed, transforming our communities through love and service. The work of making disciples is at the center of who we are as a church, and it has to be at the center of everything that we do, including parish life. Now, before that causes you any anxiety, remember that the next thing that Jesus tells his disciples, after giving them the Great Commission, the very final words, he says, behold, I am with you always until the end of the ages. So Jesus sends us on mission, but he promises to be with us always. It is his power that is at work in any of our efforts at evangelization. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit that makes all of the difference. I know many of you have had uh, had to listen to me preach at confirmations, and that's always the, the point that I make is that the Holy Spirit changed everything in the lives of the apostles. They went from being men who were timid and afraid to being bold proclaimers of the gospel like Father Bear, like Father Erickson. It's the Holy Spirit that changes everything. The Acts of the Apostles provides an incredible account of Christ's followers continuing his mission. This book of the Bible is full of prophetic speeches, miraculous works of mercy, and brave witnesses to the gospel. And it provides many examples of missionary discipleship applicable even today. But it's important to note how the Acts of the Apostles begins, not with amazing feats accomplished by the Apostles, but rather with their reception of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. You know the, the Gospel verse from the, from the Acts of the Apostles, the Biblical verse. Suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them tongues as of fire, which parted and came to rest on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. Those first disciples of Jesus already had the sacraments. We know that from the first Holy Thursday. And they had the first-hand teachings of Jesus in the course of his public ministry. But they needed more. They needed the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that transformed them into joyful missionary disciples. 
With the Holy Spirit as our guiding force, our work needs to be about evangelization. All of us, or most of us, I would guess, have received the, the Holy Spirit when we're at the time of our baptism, and then we're sealed with the Holy Spirit in the great sacrament of confirmation. But we're given that great gift for that mission that is evangelization, the spreading of the gospel. Now, evangelization sounds scary to some people, I understand. Huh? It sounds Protestant to others. Huh? But it is at our very core from the beginning of our Catholic Church. And it has to continue in the work of our parishes. Huh? St. John Paul II spoke not only about evangelization, but also about the new evangelization. The parish is key to both. Let me draw just that distinction. So evangelization, as it's historically known, is sharing the gospels with those who didn't know Jesus. Huh? St. John Paul II was very uh, keen in recognizing, however, that there was a need to go forward and to share the gospel in much the same way, even with those who had once known Jesus, or maybe had even once accepted Jesus, but had, had drifted away from the church, that we needed to be able to engage in that same work of evangelization to stir up once again the faith in those who had become tepid, those who no longer had Jesus at the very center of their lives. Now, I know that many of you had the opportunity to participate in the prayer and listening events that in our first year in preparing for the Synod. We had over 8,000 people in our archdiocese participate. I think it was close to 35,000 written comments. That's a, a lot of information. Huh? And as we tried to sift through all of that and to put it into categories, we found, and it wouldn't be surprising to any of you who were there, that the, one of the number one concerns was about how it is that we as a church pass on the faith to our young people, but also how is it that we uh, are able to engage our neighbors? How is it that we're able to re-engage even our, our family members who once sat in these pews with us, but who no longer are here on Sundays? We, we miss them, we miss the gifts that God has given to them. And we know that we want to share with them what we think is the most important part of our lives. Huh? That's really crucial for us. And as we go through the Synod, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, about our next steps, our hope is to be able to, uh, to put our heads together to figure out how it is that the Holy Spirit is leading us to respond to that situation. And as Father Erickson hinted, uh, we're pretty sure that the parish is key to that. So one of our three uh, focus areas for the Synod is how it is that the parish can be that place of evangelization. It's key to all of our efforts. Huh? The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops has an interesting phrase. It says that the parish is the neighborhood of the new evangelization true of evangelization as well, but it's the neighborhood. It's where it takes place in, in an almost familial context with people that we know from our, uh, from our area, from our region. It's where the faith is passed down, where it's lived and sustained for all members of the body of Christ. But it's something that is focused on a neighborhood, on our coming together. Evangelization is truly rooted in the parish. It's in the parish that one becomes engaged with the church community. It's in the parish that one learns how to become a disciple of Christ. And it's a parish where one is nourished by the scripture, just as you're uh, so nourished by the preaching of Father Bear and Father Erickson. It's the parish where we're nourished by the sacraments and where we uh, ultimately and eventually become evangelizers. Remember, the USCCB would say, an evangelizer is merely a disciple 
who shares his or her faith. Huh? That's what we want to do. We, we can't be disciples unless we're willing to accept that great commission that Jesus gave to his church. Unless we're willing to accept some personal responsibility for that work of the faith. Now, what is it that we, we, we can understand that that's the work of the church in general, but where do our parishes fit into that? Huh? Uh, just about this time last year, maybe at the end of June, I guess, of 2020, the Congregation for Clergy put out an interesting document that spoke about uh, the conversion of parishes for the work of evangelization. Hmm? And... Um, it's a f fascinating document. It talks about parish structures, but it also, especially in the first part, speaks about what it is that we expect from a parish community. The instruction begins, the parish has a long history, and from the outset, it has played a fundamental role in the life of Christians and in the development and pastoral work of the church. We can see this, the instruction goes on, in the writings of St. Paul. Several of the Pauline texts show us the formation of small communities as domestic churches, which the Apostle Paul, our patron, patron simply calls a house. With these houses, we get a foretaste of the birth of the first parishes. It was in those homes where people came uh, to celebrate the Eucharist, to hear the word proclaimed, to share their experiences, to fortify one another in the faith at a time of great challenge. The instruction goes on to say that since its inception, the parish is envisioned as a response to a precise pastoral need, namely that of bringing the gospel to the people through the proclamation of the faith and the celebration of the sacraments. The etymology of the word parish makes clear the meaning of the institution. The parish is a house among houses, and it's a response to the logic of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, alive and active among the community. It is visibly characterized then, the instruction says, as a place of worship, as a sign of the permanent presence of the risen Lord in the midst of his people. So that's, that's your function as a parish, whether you're parishioners here at Transfiguration or wherever, that your parish is called to be a place of worship, but also a sign of the permanent presence of the risen Lord in the midst of his people. Often, I think for us as Catholics, we, we know that instinctively. So we, when we come into a church, we, we look for the tabernacle, which is one of the ways in which there's that permanent presence of Christ. When we see the, the, the sanctuary candle burning, we're reassured of the presence of Christ. Huh? But it's beyond that as well that it's in the, the gospel that's proclaimed. It's the way in which we come together as a community. Uh, it's the way in which we're able then to be sent and to go forth that, we, that we're able to be that sign of the permanent presence of Christ among his people. Not just within the walls of the church, but in the midst of the messiness of the world, of our families, of our communities, of the struggling communities, of which we are a part. Now, many of you know that my, my training is as a canon lawyer, which isn't the most exciting part of the church. Huh? But I'll, allow me just to uh, go to the code of canon law just for a second to talk a little bit about what the code says about the parish. In canon 515 section one, it says that a parish is a certain community of Christ's faithful stably established within a particular church whose pastoral care under the authority of the diocesan bishop is entrusted to a parish priest as its proper pastor. So we can take that apart a little bit. So when it's talking about a certain community of Christ's faithful, it means that you know who's a member of the parish and who isn't. 
there's a well-defined uh, criterion for who belongs to this grouping of the parish. And it's established within a particular church, meaning within a diocese. So it's not independent from the diocese. It's, it's part, it's a cell of the diocese. And it, as it's def usually it's defined in terms of territory. So uh, Transfiguration Parish has boundaries. Anybody that lives within the boundaries of, that, of this parish, those boundaries that were set forth by the bishop when he established this parish are members of this parish. I know there are many others who come far and uh, from uh, far away even to hear Father Erickson's stimulating preaching. Huh? But ultimately it's the people who live within the boundaries of the parish that are certainly the members of this parish. And that's why they're saying it's a certain community of Christ's faithful and it says it's stably established. So it's not just those who, who come and wander into the parish on any given Sunday. Huh? There's a permanence that's there. There's a, a stability that's there. And it enables us then to be able to support one another in that stability. Huh? But the, the code speaks in particular of how it's always under uh, the guidance of the diocesan bishop. That's actually not, not a huge part. But it's because the diocesan bishop, that's me, has entrusted this parish to a proper pastor, Father Erickson, or before him, Father Bear. So you, you can't really have a parish stably erected unless there's the intention that there would be a pastor who is at the very hub of the great work that goes on in the parish. Now, after the Second Vatican Council, we certainly understand that it's not only the, the pastor who is significant for the life of the church. There's that beautiful collaboration of the, the lay faithful, and there's that beautiful collaboration of uh, consecrated men and women. Sister, I'm so happy to see you're here. Huh? But it's the way in which it's all brought together uh, to that hub that is the pastor who is uh, given the pastoral care of this community. So you don't really define the parish in terms of the church building. What's important is the community centered around the pastor. Now, interestingly enough, the code doesn't go on to say too much more about parishes, other than to say they can either be territorial or they can be personal by a uh, you can have a, a, some personal uh, characteristic that would make you member of a parish. So in the old days, St. Casimir's, for example, on the east side of St. Paul, anybody who was Polish living in that community belonged to St. Casimir's. It wasn't because of the territory, it was because of, of um, their ethnic heritage, right? Or, and we saw so many of those ethnic parishes. Uh, but most of our parishes were territorial. But what's most significant is that they were all under the care of a pastor who was given that task by the bishop. Huh? As I said, the code doesn't go on to talk too much more about the parish, but it does talk about the pastor, and I think it gives us some interesting insights from that. Huh? So one of the things that it mentions in Canon 528 is that the parish priest, the pastor, has the obligation of ensuring that the word of God is proclaimed in its entirety to those living in the parish. So that's the first task that it speaks about, is making sure that the word of God is proclaimed. And it doesn't say to just those who put in their envelopes on Sunday. It doesn't even to say just to those who are baptized but it says to those who live in the territory. So that's, that's Father's job, but it, it, the importance is being able to preach the word of God. And it says he is therefore, to, in that work of preaching the word of God, to see to it that the lay members of Christ's faithful are instructed in the truths of faith, especially by means of the homily on Sundays and holy days of obligation, and also by catechetical formation. So certainly those, those homilies have an, a significant role 
in Father's ability to, to share with you the word of God, but it's also in the other work that goes on in this parish that helps people to plumb the depths of our teaching. That's what we speak about when we talk about catechetical formation. And it, the code says then that the pastor is to foster works which promote the spirit of the gospel, including its rele relevance to social justice, mentioning that he is supposed to have a special care for the Catholic education of children and of young people. So when you think about re the religious education program here at Transfiguration, when you think about the work of passing on the faith that goes on in your wonderful parish school, it gives you a sense for how it is that the parish in its work of evangelization has to be centered on sharing the word of God. And the code says, with the collaboration of the faithful, the pastor is to make every effort to bring the gospel message to those also who have given up religious practice or who do not profess the true faith. Huh? That's, that's there in the code. That that's that work of evangelization. And you'll notice that that's one of the places where it's very clear that it's not just the pastor, but it's with the collaboration of the faithful. So you're given that responsibility of collaborating with Father Erickson or whoever your pastor might be and going out to those who, who might have drifted away from religious practice, or those who have never professed the true faith. That's the work of evangelization. As the code goes on to speak a little bit more about the pastor, it gives us a sense of, of how that can happen. Because it says that the parish priest, the pastor, has to take care that the Blessed Eucharist is the center of the parish assembly of the faithful. That he's to strive to ensure that the faithful are nourished by the devout celebration of the sacraments, and in particular, that they frequently approach the sacraments of the Blessed Eucharist and penance. Now, I've been here on a number of occasions for Mass, and I'm always moved by how reverently this community celebrates the Eucharist. Huh? You see the, the care with which the sanctuary is maintained and presented. You think about the, the work that Father Bear did to structure the sanctuary, to, uh, to facilitate that kind of devotion. Huh? But it's, it's not just with the celebration of the Eucharist, but also uh, with the celebration of the Sacrament of Reconciliation. I, I've been here on a number of occasions for uh, the celebration of penance in Lent and in Advent. I, know, I don't know if Father gets his whip out or what, but I know that there are many of you who, who regularly come for the sacrament of penance. And you might not think of that in terms of evangelization, but the church would say that it's in, it's in the reverent celebration of the sacraments, plural, so the Eucharist and the other sacraments, that we have the opportunity as a parish to share the gospel. Now certainly when, when we personally are benefiting from the sacrament of reconciliation, we're strengthened by God's grace to go forward and to do that work. But even just in the reverence with which your community holds up reconciliation, holds up baptism, holds up confirmation or the anointing of the sick, it's the way in which you're able to share the gospel not only with those in the pews, not only with those who are drift, have drifted away, but also with those who have never known Jesus or the church. Now we always try to look for silver linings in even the, the darkest of clouds. And certainly we've had a very difficult time with COVID. But one of the interesting things is that as uh, our parishes have turned to live streaming mass or to taping mass, it's made the Eucharist, in, in, in the celebration of the Eucharist, in the way that we gather as a community, much more accessible to people. I, I've personally heard, and I know Bishop Cousins has as well, from non-Catholics who have been watching uh, the Eucharist on television or on, or on Facebook or whatever uh, um, uh, venue there might be, and, and that they're finding that it's somehow touching their hearts and, and raising questions within their minds, right? 
And so it's the way in which we as, as the Catholic people celebrate the sacraments that's going to touch the hearts of those who need to know the gospel. That has to be something that's really important for us. The code goes on to say besides the, uh, really holding up the sacraments, that the parish and certainly the, uh, with the pastor at its center also has to be able to lead the members of the parish and others to prayer even more broadly, including prayer in families, to take a live and active part in the sacred liturgy. So it's, it's the way in which there's this beautiful continuum that we're inspired by the celebration of the Eucharist. It leads us into deeper prayer. And it's through that prayer that we then want to come back isn't that the experience when you, when you talk to converts, when you, you talk to people who are reverts, who have somehow or another, after being away from the church, found their way back, they're excited by being able to be once again at the table of the Lord. And they've experienced that the sacraments have, have energized them once again and deepened their prayer lives, which only makes them all the more hungry for the sacraments. Certainly, it's, it's, it's significant that we do that in the context of a parish. Now, the parish priest, the pastor, is called to make sure that all of his parishioners, all of the people living in his parish, have a, have a, a sensitivity to the needs of the universal church. So when Father's able to talk about Mama T, Mother Teresa, and to talk about the, the work that his his, even his blood sisters do in, in, in terms of uh, more outside of the archdiocese going forth and doing that work of mission. Huh? Or he's able to speak about uh, those who have um, uh, you know, our, our foreign missions, our mission in Venezuela, our connection with the mission, uh, the beautiful church in, in Katui, in Kenya, that those things are always important. But it goes on to say that the pastor in particular has to endeavor to ensure that the faithful are concerned for the community of the parish, that they feel themselves to be members both of the diocese and of the universal church, and that they take part in sustained works which promote this community. So you hear so often people that will say these days, I don't really belong to a church, I'm spiritual but I don't belong. Huh? And it's, uh, that's always um, sad when I hear that, right? Because I, I, I know that there's such a, a gift that Christ wants to give people through his church. But even when I hear that among faithful Catholics who will say that they don't really go to any one parish, that they're R Roman Catholics as well as Roman Catholics, huh? I understand that, huh? but at the same time, it's important that we make a commitment to a parish. Huh? And that we, because it's the way in which we're not only going to be plugged in with a pastor, and that we're going to be hearing in a consistent way the, uh, the intricacies of the gospel explained to us, but it's a way in which we're also then able to relate to one another um, in great faith, but in a way that uh, helps, helps us to grow in the faith and helps our brothers and sisters. We have to make sure though that as we do that, that we always have that sensitivity to those who don't yet know Jesus. The fundamental task of a parish always has to be evangelization. Pope Francis in this regard has said this, if something should rightly disturb us and trouble our consciences, it is the fact that so many of our brothers and sisters are living without the strength, light, and consolation born of friendship with Jesus Christ, without a community of faith to support them, without meaning and a goal in life. More than by fear of going astray, my hope is that we will be moved by the fear of remaining shut up within structures which give us a false sense of security within rules which make us harsh, harsh judges, within habits which make us feel safe, while at our door people are starving, and Jesus never tires of saying to us, give them something to eat. So Pope Francis is saying we have to be focused on our parishes, 
that it, it can't just be navel-gazing about ourselves. We always have to have that sensitivity to those who are hungry, those who are hungry for the gospel, those who are hungry for human attention, those who are hungry for the basic needs of life. Now that, that sense of uh, being a, par- a good parish, uh, being drawn to what's outside, is not new to Pope Francis. Huh? That instruction that I spoke about at the beginning of our talk from the Congregation of Clergy in paragraph 12 notes that the fathers of the Second Vatican Council were prescient in writing that the care of souls should always be infused with a missionary spirit. In continuity with this teaching, St. John Paul specified that while the parish is perfected and integrated in a variety of forms, it nevertheless remains an indispensable organism of primary importance in the visible and visible structure of the church, whereby evangelization is the cornerstone of all pastoral action, the demands of which are primary, preeminent, and preferential. Huh? Pretty strong three Ps there. Primary, preeminent, and preferential. That's evangelization in the life of a parish. St. John Paul's uh, successor, Benedict XVI, taught that the parish is a beacon that radiates the light of the faith and thus responds to the deepest and truest desires of the human heart, giving meaning and hope to the lives of individuals and families. Huh? In order to promote the centrality of the missionary presence of the Christian community in the world, it is important not only to think about a new experience of parish, of a revitalized parish, but also about the ministry and mission of priests who together with the lay faithful have the task of being salt and light for the world. Huh? That light on the lampstand, excuse me, that lamp on the lampstand, showing forth the face of an evangelizing community capable of an adequate reading of the signs of the times and of giving witness to coherent evangelical living. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, I I, I see I've been talking for a long time, so I'll I'll try to abbreviate a little bit more, but one of the ways in which all of those popes have seen the parish as being uh, particularly important is that we have that opportunity to translate the gospel into the particular circumstances of our day and place. So I don't know what it is that uh, is specific to Maplewood or Oakdale. (laughs) I don't know what's specific to the the Archdiocese of St. Paul and Minneapolis, but there are those things, there are those ways of speaking, there are those issues that are important to us and that the gospel has to be explained in a way that is particular to what it is that we're experiencing. So whether it be the way in which we've had an experience of COVID, whether it's the way in which we've had the experience of of the death of uh, George Floyd or Derek Chauvin and the way in which our society has reacted to that, that the gospel has to be able to be broken open in a way that's particular to us. And that's what the parish is able to do. Now, the the pastor to do that needs, needs to know He needs to know you, his flock. As I was coming in, somebody spoke about uh, priests that have the smell of the sheep on them. That's one of Pope Francis's sayings, but it's significant and it's crucial that that happens so that the word of God that's proclaimed is one that resonates in this community, that somehow or another, a father is able to, to touch those aspects of your lives that need to be enlightened by the gospel. So, so often, and I suspect this will be part of our discussion in the Synod, as I mentioned, we have lots of very faithful Catholics who, who aren't necessarily tied to any one parish. But there's that advantage of having that consistent preaching, not only from Father Erickson, but from Father Brian as well. That, and, and there's that sense of the community and the way that you celebrate that, that makes it all so real. And it's the way that Father then has the opportunity to come to know not just a, 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 a never-ending revolving door of Catholics coming for the sacraments, 
but it's the way in which he's able to be rooted in a community so that his preaching, uh, that is certainly informed by his, his contact with you in everyday life and uh, the way in which he's, he's dealing with uh, you and your families in faith formation or in the schools, the way in which he's encountering people in the sacrament of reconciliation, that all of those things are together informing his preaching in a way that makes it particular to hear. And it's not just the priests, but it's, it's all of you as the collaborators in that important work, that you're able to share the faith with your neighbors in a way that that somebody 3,000 miles away is not able to do. You know them, you know the issues, you know what it is that we're experiencing together. And so the, the parish ends up being the crucible where we get to mix all of these things together and there's that beautiful personal encounter with the word of God. That's the way in which the parish is really able to be uh, a, an incredible instrument of evangelization, what it is that we're hoping for, that we're providing that fruitful and creative encounter between the gospel and the lives of the people in our community. In these last uh, few minutes, just a, a sense of, obviously we, we know that we need to be, it needs to be fresh, it needs to be dynamic, it needs to be authentic in the way that we reach out to others. But we have to look for those ways of, of how it is that we can do that. And just to offer, uh, and I'm sure there will be uh, lots of suggestions that come out when we gather for the Synod. You know, our, our hope is that in every parish of the Archdiocese, that uh, in six weeks this fall, that's coming up soon, that we will have people gathering in small groups to talk about uh, those three focus areas that I mentioned, one of them being the parish in, as an instrument of evangelization. Huh? And also looking at how it is that we can become missionary disciples and how it is that we can do a better job of ministering to youth and young adults. But that in, in bringing people together, that we're going to be able to have creative ideas uh, based on maybe what your experience would be here at Transfiguration or at whatever parish you find yourself that you'll be able to share those insights in a way that gives the broader church um, certainly uh, an opportunity to go deeper in our relationship with Christ and to be better evangelizers. We need you to be able to share your experiences. What works here at Transfiguration that you think uh, could be shared in other places. Huh? How is it that you here at Transfiguration have been able to become masters in the art of accompaniment, of walking with people in various stages of their lives or when they're uh, facing uh, particular challenges, whether it be uh, losing a spouse, whether it be losing a job, whether it would be facing some diminishment in health, whatever that might be, how, how your parish has addressed those issues or how you've reached out to those who have, have drifted from the faith. Huh? All of those things are going to be important for us in the course of that synod. But just uh, uh, some of the ways, pop just to uh, we'll have an opportunity for some uh, questions and comments, but what are the things that you might be able to do uh, to really be able to be that evangelizing parish. Huh? If you go to the USCCB uh, website, it offers a few suggestions. And let me share those here. One is that uh, to be focused as a community on the word of God, that you as individuals pray daily and that you read sacred scripture, that you regularly celebrate the sacraments, especially in Sunday mass each week, that you make that commitment to be here when you can, that you trust in the Holy Spirit to give you the grace needed to share your faith with others. Huh? And indeed, there's that, uh, uh, that you'd be willing to listen to other people's stories and questions about the church without judgment, that you'd welcome new members of the parish, offer to help new parents, support the divorced and widowed, you'd participate in other service opportunities organized in the parish, that you'd personally invite your family, friends, and neighbors to Sunday Mass in a welcoming spirit, that you'd commit yourselves to studying the faith through the catechism of the Catholic Church and faith formation programs. Huh? 
So there's just some ways in which uh, each of us in our parishes uh, would be able to prepare ourselves to be uh, members of an evangelizing parish. I'm sure you have a thousand other suggestions. I look forward to hearing them in the course of the Synod. I'll be quiet now and just take any questions or comments that you might have. But thank you very much uh, for your attention. I know it was a long talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Archbishop. I'm happy to, uh, to bring the microphone to folks as you raise your, your hands, and I'll, I'll come as quick as I can. Don't all speak at once. Here's Father Brian way in the back. Oh, very good. He's a ringer. The apostle of landfall. Thank, thank you, Your Excellency, for joining us this evening. I, um, I just, I would, I would like you to encourage, perhaps, and, and give your own personal insights into, I think, perhaps, some of our parishioners from um, minority communities, people from cultures that are not Northern European like mine, have a special role to play in evangelization. because They may not know the faith as well as you or I or Father Erickson, but they have cultural knowledge that I can't breach, whether it's language or just familiarity and, and comfort. Can you give them a little encouragement to recognize their, their role in the project? Oh, Father, I think that you're right. You hit the nail on the head there, right? But it's gifts that all of us have to be able to share with others who have had similar experiences. But when we think of, uh, about the role of um, you know, the Catholic members of some of those communities that you were describing, you know, I, I think about our two Hmong parishes, St. Vincent de Paul and uh, St. Patrick's in St. Paul, right? The, the beautiful way in which um, they've been able uh, to be evangelizers, really, in, 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 in bringing the, the good news to some who had never heard of Christ. Huh? Uh, you, you might remember in the Catholic spirit a few years ago, there were 35 people who were baptized at the Church of St. Bernard from the Kareni community there. Huh? I might get that wrong. It might be the Karen community. It's either the Karen or the Kareni. Uh, but it's that same idea where there are uh, some members of that community that are on fire with the faith and they're able to live it in a credible way that then enables others to embrace that, to see uh, what it is that Christ desires for his church. You know, we have more formalized programs with Latino ministry, for example, or we have parishes that have been established for uh, Vietnamese immigrants. You know, we have a number of really strong parishes in that way. But all of us have to be able to reach out to um, those who are um, uh, like us in a way that gives them a sense of what Christ can do in our lives. And so we certainly have to uh, value the presence of those different groups. And and it's not just based on race or nationality, but even people with different gifts or different experiences, right? So, you know, one of the things that the USCCB mentioned was those who were, who were divorced. Huh? There are, I've, I've come to meet some incredible evangelizers who have experienced that in their own lives, who are able to translate the gospel to others who have experienced that sadness as well. So whatever experience it is that we've had, we're able to use that uh, to bring others to Christ. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. Uh, we certainly, uh, in the Archdiocese, we, we commit, and through your generosity with the Catholic Services Appeal, a good bit of resources for Latino ministry, but we're more and more aware that it, it has to, we have to be able to support multicultural ministry in many different ways. I, I, you know, I see the vitality of our Fili Filipino community here in the Archdiocese. I see the way in which our, our Nigerians uh, are, are just so full of faith as well, our Cameroonians. All of those different groups have that possibility of really um, bringing people to Christ. If you ever uh, go to the, um, the, mass, uh, the French Mass for the Africans at uh, St. Boniface in Northeast, much the same, there's just such energy that's there. Thanks. Yes. 
Hello, Your Excellency. Thanks so much for being here this evening. Um, and thank you for speaking to the question of the role of Catholic education in evangelization. Um, you sort of opened a door for me that I was hoping you would open. Because uh, I, as a parent of many children, one that has special education needs, one area that I see that we're really failing and in turn sending our most vulnerable students to the wolves is in providing education for our children, our special education children, because they have to go to the public schools to get robust supports. But at this time in particular, sort of the influences that are a part of that Catholic, of that public education are completely antithetical to what we're trying to teach at home. Yes. Um, and so could you use your legal expertise to mount the assault on the public schools to, to get funding to our Catholic schools <laughs> so that <laughs> so that we can keep our kids in the Catholic community that we want them to be raised in so that they can be evangelized through high school and, and more? Yes, thank you. So every year since I've been here, and I know it was started before I got here, that one of the great goals for the Minnesota Catholic Conference has been to expand uh, opportunities for uh, kids whose families want them to go to Catholic schools, especially addressing the question of tax credits or vouchers. And uh, you know, we've in, in the last four years, I think three of those years, we managed to get proposals on the governor's desk, two different governors, uh, where they've uh, languished. Huh? So there is uh, support. We have to continue. We can't give up on that for sure. There are areas that seem far more hostile uh, to the idea of Catholic education who have, uh, where, where those kinds of opportunities have been um, made possible. So we certainly can't give up on that and we'll continue to, to push for that. But the, I'm, I'm particularly sensitive to the uh, issue that you raised about students with special needs too and the ways in which we might be able to do a better job with that it's, it's going to require a lot of thinking there for sure, um, but it's, it's important for us. And, you know, one of the beautiful things is that we do the best that we can with the resources that we have. So I'm always so uh, grateful to families um, who are sending their children in, into the harsh environment of our, some of our public schools, but who manage to make sure that the kids have a totally Catholic um, outlook on life, right? And that's, I know that's not just the work of the, the family, even though that's your primary responsibility, uh, but also of the community. So we have to make sure that we're doing the very best that we can in the circumstances that we find ourselves in uh, to be able to spread the gospel uh, even in those situations. So thanks for uh, uh, offering up that reminder tonight. Thanks. Yes. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much, Your Excellency, for um, you and the other bishops of Minnesota for standing up and saying we need to reopen the parishes. I mean, that is incredible. And I will, I will, I will, my words, I can't even say how much that means to me. Um, the second part that I have is um, I wanted to say that you, what you said about the live stream in the Eucharist, that moved me so much. That was very beautiful. And I think that if there was a way to be able to, you know, if I'm a talker, so anybody knows I'll talk to them about Jesus all day long and about the sacraments and what you get at, at Christ's church. Um, I just wish that there was a... <laughs> I, I guess you got to just invite people to Mass, but... What I really wanted to say, my main thing, is that I think that a lot of times there's really good like Catholic education up to um, up to senior high, and then you know there's like sorts of groups and stuff that kids are in and things like that, you know the youth groups, but you don't see as much for the people who are like 19 to 30. I mean even the youth groups that are in some of them, youth is considered what. 35 or something, you know? I just don't know. Is there anything on a docket for having more of those, like, groups for people that are in that particular age group, yes. like your 19 to 30, the college-age kids that are getting indoctrinated on other stuff, 
and need to have the fun along with the truth. Yes. So. All right. So, as I mentioned, we have three focus areas for the Synod. One of them has to do with youth and young adults. And so that, that last concern that you raised was one that many of us had. It's one of the reasons why that consultation this fall in our parishes will be important is we, we try to get ideas, not just from those who are active in parishes, but also uh, from some of our young adults as well. How is it that we could serve them better in that important work? You know, we're, we're, we're blessed here in the archdiocese that we've had some uh, really positive developments that have uh, really been an outgrowth of the faith of the church here. So when we look at something like St. Paul's outreach and the way in which they're able to uh, help young college students to become disciples, huh, that's great, but it's still only the tip of the iceberg. And we know that we have to be able to support people much longer than that, right? So looking for those kinds of opportunities That'll be an important part of our discussion in the Synod. So if you have any ideas, let me know too. Huh? <laughs> that, and that, that is part, you know, one of the, um, you know, we want to make sure that uh, families continue to be strong and how important it is that we, we, we help our young people to find others who share their same beliefs and values. So that's significant. Thank you. Yes. Your Excellency, thanks so much for coming out tonight and taking time out of your busy schedule. Um, I just wanted to say I had the fortunate opportunity of meeting Father Bear many years ago uh, through an elderly lady that was um, a longtime parishioner in Nativity in St. Paul. And um, so I saw him there. And then when he ran St. John Vianney, that was just fabulous. I got to go to many wonderful masses he had and everything. And I think part of that, um, my husband's a convert to Catholicism, and I think he was very influential, um, along with my parents, and hopefully I had a little influence on him too. But uh, what I want to say is, um, I think it's great that the school, um, and probably the school of the St. Paul Divinity, is um, putting out priests like that nowadays, very conservative. Um, we just have a new priest over, I'm, we're from Guardian Angels, and right down the block here, and we've got Father Joe Conley, fabulous, fabulous man. And it's so great to see some priests like that again. And uh, I know just in talking to him after Mass the other day when I first met him, I said, you've got to be a student of Father Bill Bear. I can tell. <laughs> and he said, yes, I was. And he was fabulous, he said. And I said, yeah, I think so too. So I think it's great to see like the altar railings and... Um, you know, I see people with chapel veils and all that. I think it's wonderful. And I think we need to get back to that because, you know, being Catholic was never meant to be easy, but it's very rewarding if you try to do it. So yes. I, I commend you on all you're doing. And if Thanks. we can keep the great priests coming out like that, it'd be fabulous. Thanks. I encourage you to be supportive of your pastor. I mean, all of you to be supportive of your pastors, uh, but you in particular, because that's Father Connolly's first experience of leading a community, right? And right. so if he has that, that um, flock that is able to help form him and to encourage him in doing the right things, I think that's, that's extremely helpful. Now, Father Connolly also had, I suspect, the benefit of, of Father Erickson's tutelage as well, in, in, uh, in, certainly in, in, uh, in so many areas. So we're grateful for how Father John Paul has formed our seminarians as well. Thank you. You got a good one at Guardian Angels, let me just tell you. Archbishop, oh, I'm so sorry, in the front. Thank you for pointing. Thank you. Your Excellency, I was wondering if you would be able to comment on your thoughts of the Catechetical Institute as formation for laity in the evangelization role and what type of formality that might take within and post-Synod. Great. That's um, one of the best parts for me about um, the prayer and listening events that we had was that we were able to talk about the Catechetical Institute. People were saying, we need to have opportunities to learn more about our faith 
And I would say, have you ever heard about the Catechetical Institute? And, um, and it was amazing how many people had not. Huh? So uh, I, I find, uh, so often when I find people that are on fire with their faith and willing to engage in all kinds of, of uh, efforts in the archdiocese of service or of teaching, and I often ask them, you know, what prompted that? And they'll speak about their experience at the Catechetical Institute. It's a huge commitment, right? So two years of your time, uh, but it's also done in a formative community. My understanding, uh, they did an amazing job last year in the midst of COVID. And I think this year they're trying to expand that as, as well. So um, in my mind, that would be one of the things that our synod has to build upon. I think so many of, the, uh, of our leaders in the synod have come out of the Catechetical Institute. And I think that that's uh, obviously going to be one of the things that's held up, not only for... Uh, helping our parishes to be those places of evangelization, but also helping individuals to have that deepening that helps them to be missionary disciples. So I think I'm, that, that certainly will be significant in that. So thanks for bringing that up. Archbishop, again, I want to thank you so much for your time, for your, for your love for this local church, for your love for transfiguration, for your love and admiration and wonderful remarks about Father Bear. Again, perhaps we can give Archbishop a, a round of applause. We do have an opportunity out in the gathering space for a little bit of fraternity, so I'd encourage you to, to gather with us. Uh, freely you have received, now freely give, was Father Bear's motto. We don't charge for these talks, but they do require some overhead. And so on the way out of church tonight, I would encourage you to offer some donation to support this series. Tonight is the first of our three-part lecture series. Stay tuned on who the other speakers will be. We're uh, working on some very, very... Um, I think compelling speakers that will have widespread interest. So stay tuned for further details. You can write out checks if you see, so feel inclined as you put uh, your donation in the little buckets there made out to Transfiguration with Lecture Series and the Memo Line. You also, of course, can always give cold, hard cash. This coming weekend, this coming Saturday, is our parish festival. And I hope you all come, whether or not you belong to Transfiguration. We would love to have you. At 2 o'clock until 9 in the evening, we'll gather together as a family and spend some quality time together. We still have many needs for volunteers, especially during the uh, uh, couple of hours around Mass on Saturday. I think uh, Melissa told me 3 to maybe 5.30, especially in the kids' games department. So if you're going to be here, we would love to have your, your, your help. Uh, remember, we got... Uh, four masses for Sunday, so uh, no need necessarily to attend on Saturday. We'd love to have you, but if you're going to be at the festival, maybe consider volunteering and then coming to Mass on Sunday. We also have a lot of raffle tickets available, so please consider buying a raffle ticket. The grand prize is 7500 bucks. Raffle tickets cost 50 bucks at this point of the sale. All sales go directly to Transfiguration. Again, you're all welcome outside of the gathering space. Hope you can join us. We will close our doors at 9. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Uh, so uh, please join us, and uh, may God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Father, Father Erickson, can I give them a blessing? What do you think? Huh? But just the, even hearing about the festival, you know, everything that we do has to be in that key of evangelization. So you look at that as, you know, who are the people that will be coming to Transfiguration for the first time? What kind of experience will you give to them about this community of faith? Huh? So they might be attracted by funnel cakes, huh? but it, it's your opportunity then to share how Jesus and Transfiguration have made a difference in your lives. Happy Feast Day as well, and may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God.
just sticking to what I had written. And I didn't, I don't think anybody could see the 